everyone, and welcome to this week's Culture Report. I'm Jamal Simon. I'm Laura Casillas. I'm DeMarco Randall. And I'm Antonia Velez. Y'all, we usually like to chit chat, but we have a whole lot to get to Ooh, today. We, we do. Cooking. Yeah, we so let's do. just hop today. right into it. <laughs> so, first, more than 80% of non binary people believe that identifying as non binary would hurt their job search, according to a new study conducted by business.com. Well, that same study showed that they were, un- they were up to something. They were on to something. Oh, excuse me. During the study, they, spent, they sent two phantom resumes to 180 job postings. The resumes were identical, except one included they, them pronouns, and the other did not include any pronouns. Even though most companies were equal opportunity employers, they were about 3% less likely to want to contact binary candidates for initial interviews. So business also surveyed hiring managers to find out the reason behind the trend. So here's a look at some of their responses. One hiring manager said that they would trash a resume just because of the pronouns. Someone else explained a bit further, calling the pronouns silly and something that's meant for social settings, not work. And another just wasn't up for the drama that they think comes with hiring a non-binary person, or in their words, someone who thinks that they're a they them. So, I mean, this isn't, this I mean, this isn't, crazy one, it's not surprising. It oh, is a bit know. crazy, but it's not surprising. But a question I want to post to you guys real quick is, do you guys feel the need to put your own pronouns in your resumes? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I do it just because I feel like it's something that should be normalized. Like people who are non-binary or who have any other pronouns um, shouldn't have to be the only ones to be like, hey, these are my pronouns, by the way. Hmm. Like I like to say I identify as she, her. And I think that the more we do that, the more this conversation of what are your pronouns is just going to be kind of like a day to day normal thing. Yeah, I've never actually thought about doing that, Jamal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest. It's something that's never like, you know, been something that I feel like I need to add. However, to your point, I do think it would help if we all just made it like where we had to add it. I mean, maybe more people will be, you know, included and, you know, like encouraged to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was kind of interesting because it was when I was in college, kind of like a trend, it seemed like where Mm -hmm. people started adding their pronouns to their emails. They started adding them to like their callbacks. But I don't know. I don't. I never really saw it as something that I, like, had to put out there. Mm -hmm. But once it started happening, it's something that I did. Yeah. And it's something that I was like, okay, yeah, this is my identity. And kind of to Antonio's point, it's to normalize that and to help the people who do identify with those pronouns feel that normalcy. That's how I feel. It was like a sense of allyship. I feel like that's what you say when you're in college. I feel like especially within the past five years or so we saw more people doing it i have it on my email now but yeah that's just you know showing like hey you know i don't want them to feel othered i'm gonna do it too so one when a hiring manager does see it it's not like uncommon to see exactly they aren't the odd man out here yeah you know what too jamal what scares me too with all those comments that people are making the fact that they made a relationship with using those terms with social settings Mm -hmm, it's part of a person's a person's identity. Right. Totally. Like, why would you not respect that the same way as you do he or she? That's where I find, like, it's very concerning. And there's the argument that sometimes it's confusing. What would you say to those people? Who are just confused? Like, what? by using the they or them pronouns when they're, you know, I f- addressing people uh, or, uh, or uh, encountering... one person. I feel like yeah. for people that are confused, it's okay to be confused. I feel like people that want to understand will understand it's not a super super difficult concept to grasp people use it all the time like for they them pronouns let's say i gave this example earlier you someone like robs you and somebody's asking for a description he's like oh well i didn't see what shoes they were wearing it was one person but you use that gender neutral term because you don't know what gender they were or what sex they were so i was like it's the basically the same thing it's a gender neutral term for you to use but for people that are confused ask questions Try to practice it, and you don't have to be perfect. I know. I've, I've slipped up, I know, and yeah, I, I people, could do better. <laughs> people slip up. It's all about intention. It's like, so if I see that you're putting in the work, if you're intentionally calling me by pronouns I don't identify with, then that's, that's when we have a problem. I'm going to have to post <laughs> up. And I only ask you, Joel, because I know you're part of, like, you know, this, this community, mm-hmm. the LGBTQ community, and I think it's important for us to understand, like, why it's so important for us to use those terms. Totally. Directly. Totally agree. Well, as reproduction rights rollbacks continue in the United States, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled that a near-total abortion ban from 1864 is enforceable. 
The 160-year-old ban prohibits abortions from the moment of conception, even in cases of rape and incest, and only provides an exception to save someone's life. The law carries a prison sentence of two to five years for anyone who performs or helps someone get an abortion. However, Arizona's attorney general on Tuesday vowed she would not prosecute anyone under it. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs weighed in as well, emphasizing that the best way to fight the ruling is to vote for a constitutional amendment to protect abortion rights. This November, Arizonans may have an opportunity to make their voices heard on this important issue. To the people across Arizona who are concerned about the future of abortion rights in our state, who are worried about their bodily autonomy, who don't want to see the freedom of their wives, sisters, and daughters restricted, you can make your concerns known at the ballot box, and I encourage you to do so. So the law is currently on a 14-day hold pending a lower court's review, and Governor Hobbs says she's sure that advocates of reproductive rights will appeal the ruling during that window. And a new report shows that more Latino students are, are starting to get college degrees. According to analysis by Excelencia in Education, there's been about a 4% increase in overall percentage of people who get college degrees. And Hispanic students accounted for the vast majority of that increase. The report also found that Latino college students are overwhelmingly first-generation students. But the report shows that there are still challenges. Latinos remain underrepresented in higher education and overrepresented in low paying jobs, despite having the highest labor participation rate of any group. That is crazy that to is me. So wild. <laughs> Just clearly we need to talk about our college experiences and why like we still need to like, you know, have more people go to college and be inspired or wanting to go because I don't know how your experience was with college. Mine was more of a, hey, Laura, um, I'm so happy if you finish high school. And that was like the bar for me. And it just, it just, it's something cultural. My mom came from a small town. And so that's kind of like my experience with it. It was hard, really hard, because nobody was there to show me like the ropes and how to do things, even yeah. apply for FAFSA. But oh, yeah. how was your I experience? Mean, I can totally relate to that. Being the high school I went to was a rather small school. And the majority of us were Hispanic or, you know, Mexican descent. But the thing is, not only was us going to college first generation, but sometimes, like you said, graduating from high school. Yeah. A lot of those folks, that they were the first in their family to graduate from high school and then go on to college and then graduate from college. Mm -hmm. So they're like dual, they're dual first gen. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. It's, it's crazy, you know, and it's really... Uh, I think it's really cool to see a lot more Latino folks in higher education. And I think that that trend is something that's going to continue to grow. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in my experience, I, I, mine was a little different because I grew up in Colombia yeah. and I was very much raised with the expectation of you're going to leave. Like you're not going to go to school in Colombia. You're going to go to the United States and get an education there. How come? Um, I think honestly, it, it just goes hand, hand in hand with this perception that the United States is like the powerhouse of the world, which it very much is in a lot of ways. But I do think that a lot of Latino communities have romanticized the United States. And that's why we a lot of us end up moving here, living here, getting our education here. Um, but I yeah, I, I grew up very much with that expectation. My parents made sure that and I am, you know, in the end, grateful for it. But that's not to say that I couldn't have gotten a great education in Colombia either. Yeah. It's just like all of these kind of misconceptions, I think. But um, in the end, um, you know, I am where I am and I'm grateful to have had the education that I did. But again, I mean, the U.S. also has its issues. So I, yeah. an education in Colombia would have also been, been great, I'm sure. Yeah. What about you, Jamal? Me? Uh, well, my parents... I mean, of course, they encouraged me to go. My dad has always been like, college isn't for everyone, and that's okay. But he wasn't about to have me not go to college and not do anything. <laughs> he was like, if you don't go to college, you need to get, like, I don't know, pick up a trade or do yeah. something, get yeah. some sort of certification. But I know my mom really pushed me. I was the first person in my family to get a college degree. So yeah. that's great. Since then, since I got my degree, my mom has gone back to school. She's a registered nurse now. So that's she has all her, certificate, her certificates and her degrees now. But... Yeah, I was the first one, so I didn't really have... I had cousins and stuff to look to, but yeah. 
So that was a little bit of pressure, but I wanted to go anyway. I know some people think college is a scam. <laughs> in some cases it can be, but I promise it's very beneficial. It does something to you. Yeah. I really do think like the social aspect of it too, like it helps you when you go seeking jobs yeah. and you know, just totally. creating relationships in the future. Absolutely. Love that. All right, well, <laughs> Latinos are great, right? We already knew that, but not everyone knows just how great they are when it comes to baseball. According to the MLB, Latino and Hispanic players made up 30.2% of major league rosters in 2023. And in Colorado, Latinos played a huge role in making baseball the sport that it is today. Before the beloved Rockies, there was a team called the Greeley Grays, which gained momentum in 1925 when Latinos came to Colorado to work on sugar beet fields. Grays players lived in the Greeley Spanish colony, which was housing for the Great Western Sugar Company. Gabe Lopez, whose father and grandfather played for the Grays, says this team was born out of the workers' passion. They would practice after work in the fields just before it get, got really dark. And even during the, the nighttime, they would have all the cars around and turn the lights on and they would play, play catch and pick up grounders and stuff like that. Practice until uh, that Sunday when they they had a game and played. Lopez says Great Western started supporting the Grays after seeing the sport's positive impact on the workers. And like many other so-called farm leagues, the Greeley Grays got great. You know, teams from all over Northeastern Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska playing these teams, um, and they didn't want to face the Greeley Grays. Nobody wanted to face the Greeley Grays. They were just too good. So that was Chris Bowles, manager of the Greeley History Museum, which is currently displaying an exhibit that highlights Latinos' influence on baseball in Colorado. Um, and if you happen to be watching in Colorado, you can visit this exhibit until October 5th, and you can also find Gary Shapiro's full story on it on 9news.com. I love that. Love that. <laughs> A NASA team has gone viral for dancing to banda music during the 2024 eclipse in Mazatlan, Mexico. The NASA team was in Mazatlan to do research on the eclipse and educate people on seeing it safely. But we're but why were people obsessed with the team dancing on the streets? Well, Mazatlan, like many other cities in Latin America, has been hit with gentrification. Beaches there have long been known for playing banda music, but the area has seen an influx of white tourists, some of whom are complaining about the loud, iconic music. In protest, the locals have been proudly playing banda as loud as they can. The NASA team dancing through the streets of Mazatlan to banda was seen as a symbol of respect and appreciation for the Mexican culture. Mm -hmm. And in Puerto Vallarta, a couple sued a restaurant for playing Mexican music. The owner of Gabby's restaurant, which has been there for more than 35 years, said foreigners moved next door to the restaurant and sued, claiming the music was affecting their quality of life. <laughs> I know. That is crazy. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That is so, so they're going crazy. to first. Let's start with Mazatlan. I'm like, guys, yeah. like Mazatlan is banda music. Like that's exactly why people go there. Yeah. You yeah. know, and to see people like going there and imposing like their ways, I'm like, guys, no. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, the whole thing with the pandemic made a lot of people go out to Mexico and live off of, you know, the less expensive lifestyle there, making mm -hmm. dollar bills, but then, which is fine, you know, but you're not really contributing to the infrastructure or mm -hmm. paying taxes. Or the culture. Or the culture. And then now to complain, I just, I can't with no, this. You want to I just don't know why you would <laughs> implant yourself there and then complain. I'm like, I promise they have been doing this. This isn't new. They yeah. were doing this before you moved in, I promise. That's their you, culture. You That's their go. history. Yeah, like we need to respect traditions. Yeah. I, I don't understand. I, 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 I'm not sure where this lawsuit, like, I don't know. I just genuinely, I don't know. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm, I'm so gobsmacked <laughs> because I can't imagine moving to a different country and then com not enjoying their culture and wanting to sue them right. to change it. I'm like, this is how gentrification starts. This is how the loss of culture starts. Yep. It's like they complain about one thing, they get this one place shut down, and slowly it's a trickle effect. And then other people start coming in, they're like, this is more my style. <laughs> well, it wasn't It wasn't before Homeboy over here came over and started changing stuff. Yeah, so so I don't, it's I don't so like infuriating, that. the audacity. Like, it's just like, 
where did you get the audacity? Yeah, but I think it's also good that there's so many protests going on, demonstrations of people. Like, it's creating conscious. It really is. People are like, no, these are my traditions. I'm going to defend them. And I think this is something that the culture there is going to win. The people there are going to defend and they're going to keep because already I think that's a battle they lost in Mazatlan, at least. Yeah, battle. Well, yeah, battle they lost. The, the, I mean, the people that come out to Mexico. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Keep rocking out. <laughs> Period. Okay, okay. And making H-Town proud, Beyonce broke another record with the release of Cowboy Carter. Bay became the first black woman to debut at number one on Billboard's Top Country Albums chart. As some of you may know, in February, one, one of the debut singles from the album, Texas Hold'em, captured the top spot on the Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart. It's Beyonce's eighth number one on the Billboard's charts. And the theater company behind the upcoming West End production of Romeo and Juliet is speaking out after the racial abuse against one of its stars. So in a post to social media, the Jamie Lloyd Company noted the barrage of hateful comments being directed at Francesca Amawuda River, who is black and is also starring as Juliet alongside Tom Holland. The company said the behavior must stop and they insist that they'll continue to support and protect everyone in the company at all costs. People on social media were quick, quick to place blame on the diverse casting, with one commenter saying, quote, directors know the public hate force inclusion, yet they continue doing it. I, I feel like, no, I, was gonna, I don't know why I was about to say that comment is valid. It's not valid. The public doesn't hate diverse cast. Some, I, I feel like the minority of the public are just the loudest. They hate diverse casting, but I don't even know that that's an issue here because, as we discussed, when it comes to Romeo and Juliet, if they want to, like, they're like, oh, well, no, it's not because she's black. It's because she's, she's just ugly. Juliet's <gasps> supposed to be beautiful. I'm like, well, a Juliet's role was originated by a man because Literally. on the Elizabethan stage, like, <sighs> women weren't allowed on the stage. So if we really want to get technical, maybe we should have a actual man in a wig if we really want to stay totally. true to the literature and I've, i saw a lot of comments too that were like it's just not like the accurate representation of what it should be the same point goes to that if you yeah. really knew that much about the history of plays and shakespearean plays of that men played women yeah. so these are this is just an excuse for you to be racist quite frankly like yeah. you really you don't actually care about the play no. you're just just say that you're racist I'm just so sad that this day and age we're still, or people are still judging black, like, actresses and, and artists on, like, their race instead of, like, their talent. Oh. I, I'm so, like, I can't believe it that we're still, like, seeing this. And why it's immediately, like, well, they just did it because they want to be diverse, they want to be woke. I'm like, what if she was just talented and she was the best exactly. for the role? Yeah. And people are like, well, Tom Holland deserves an Oscar for having a want to, like, kill himself over her. And I'm like, first of all, it's staged, so a Tony. Two, I was like, you don't think she's beautiful. I'm like, yeah. what? I feel like there's a skewed idea yeah. of beauty. I'm like, sure, like, I feel like, I guess Western beauty ideals, sure, like, maybe that might not be what you're attracted to, but, like, there are plenty of people who think that she's beautiful. I think Myself she's included. I've I think she's absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. And, by the way, like... I don't know. I was about to kind of diss Tom Holland. I don't think no. he deserves that. But, like, <laughs> she probably is a very, very, very good... She's probably very, very good at what she does, you know? So she deserves this role. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think we touched this on a previous show, but the Hollywood Diverse Report keeps coming out. And this is more on television, obviously, but still audiences prefer diverse casts. So I yep. think this small little group of people just needs to... Go away. Yeah, Stop and commenting. if y'all wanted to know, they're doing great. They sold out on West End, and Yay. there's rumors that it's such high demand that they're going to be transferring over to Broadway. So if y'all want to see it, y'all might be able to see it real soon. So I'll definitely keep y'all updated on if that happens. And but stay mad. Actually, don't. Stay, well, yeah. <laughs> like, just stay silently mad. Yeah. I, don't, no, I don't care. But, yeah, from the stage to the screen, what we're watching right now, y'all. Oh, my oh, God. Lord. When that came out, yeah, I reacted like someone died. It hurt my feelings. Mom basically said I was going to hell. I didn't write the Bible. I don't think anybody's being hard on you. I think people are calling you to do better. And Lord, I come to you, Gerard and I, take the desire from my son to be with a male. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I love you. Okay. 
She's like, <laughs> like I'm just like, oh, I love you. Let me, but I just wish I could change all these things about you. Yeah. I'm like, okay, lovely. Oh. But we're watching the Jamar, Gerard Carmichael reality, reality show, show on Max. It's so stunning. It oh really follows his life. It's so intimate, guys. Like, watching this was so important. Like, I really got so nervous. Like, I, my heart was beating watching it because I was like. Is the camera in the room right now? I was like, <laughs> I felt so seen. I mean, there's so much of his life that I can't relate to because he's a millionaire and I'm not. But it's just like I the. Think, I think one of the most interesting things about this also, it, it gives perspective that people might have never seen before. Exactly. It literally is giving like light and a stage for something to get the exposure that it needs. Totally. Yeah. yeah. To see a black queer successful man like the behind yes. the scenes how they yeah. operate whether it be from their relationships to their career to their family like yes. especially with the family there are things that played out there i always wonder i'm like oh if i did this what would happen and then it happened and i was like that's probably <laughs> it like this <laughs> meant so much to me watching like i didn't agree with everything he did i'm, oh, yeah. I'm not saying that <laughs> Lord knows. Lord there knows. are some wild <laughs> things in there well you got me to watch reality tv First off, so yeah. I was like, oh my God, what am I watching? Yeah. <laughs> but, what is happening? But it was really good. I think it also gave me like more insight on just really reminding myself and, you know, just amongst us, social media and everything we see on TV and celebrities, it's not real. Mm -hmm. Like this guy is a millionaire. We got to see like a lot of parts where he was really in solitude, like alone. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's something to remind us that. We have to be careful, like, when we see people and, you know, the way we also, like, run our lives, maybe sometimes comparing ourselves or, or assuming that everybody's living great lives because a lot of people are suffering. They're yeah. suffering in silence. He was so going true. through it. And he is yeah. not representative of all black queer men, no. but that's just, yeah, you know, just one. Just, just one. But we love representation. <laughs> yes. I mean, obviously, that's one of the reasons why I just love any form of depiction of queerness and queerness existence and queer love. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I think the structure and the makeup of the show is genius. I have genuinely never seen any show like this. Like the, the moments when he is being the most vulnerable and raw, he is presumably in front of a stage full of people. Um, and I think that's a very key difference between regular reality TV and this show because he's being so raw, but he's being so raw in front of a crowd of people. So I think this to him is like kind of a statement of through my work and th through the way that I present myself. Although, like you said, Laura, I do think that, you know, social media doesn't always portray who we are. He is saying, I am being the realest version of myself and I want to share that with the world. And I think that is so beautifully done and I have never seen anything like that. So kudos <laughs> for real. I like it gave me like Shakespearean <laughs> soliloquy vibes. No. It, it literally did. And that's not a reach. Like oh. I, I genuinely, I think that this is so well made and I'm so excited for Friday yeah. um, because that's when the new episodes come out. Yeah. So that foot, the foot scene. That. The foot scene. Yeah, somebody was stuck on toes. We're not going to talk about that here. <laughs> Oh, that, no. that, that's where the culture that's report the after I was show. like, oh my God. So anyway, I had to just mention that because I was like, Jamal, I'm watching this right now. What am I watching? But it, is it, was, it, it was good. It's it was art, y'all. <laughs> it's art. It's art. It's art. Come on. Let's get to some good news, Jack. Right, yes, let's get to our good news, guys. A new Hispanic marketplace is bringing new opportunities, entrepreneurship, and culture to Aurora, Colorado. Plaza Colorado is now home to over 100 businesses, mostly Hispanic owned. La Plaza is also low in barriers for business owners. It allows vendors to lease a space at a low cost and it's opening the door for new jobs. You can find anything from clothing to jewelry, candy, arcade games, and even tax services. And this past weekend, more people watched the Women's NCAA Championship game than the 2023 NBA Finals and MLB World Series. According to Nielsen, there were an average of 19 million viewers for the, finals, for the final game between South Carolina and Iowa. Viewership peaked at around 24 million in the final 15 minutes. The men's NCAA championship game had around 4 million fewer viewers. And women just keep making history. In a landmark litigation, the Senior Women for Climate Protection, a group of more than 2,000 older Swiss women, argued before Europe's highest human rights court that their government's measures to combat climate change were insufficient, and the court ruled in favor of them. 
According to the Associated Press, this is the first time an international court has ruled on climate change and the first ruling that confirms countries are obligated to protect its people from the consequences. And another climate win, the EPA is issuing new rules to protect people living in areas near chemical manufacturers. According to the EPA studies, more than 100,000 people live within six miles of factories that release toxic chemicals, increasing their risk of getting cancer. One new rule cuts the amount of hazardous pollutants factories are allowed to release. The EPA says this will cut the cancer risk for our communities by 96%. Love. That's crazy. Yes. It's crazy. Oh, like, why is this just now happening? I, I know. Like, this could have been in place a long time ago. And just so y'all know, like, this will impact low income and communities of color the most. Yeah. So, and we know that, you know, they tend to live there more often. So, yeah, environmental racism. Mm -hmm. Come on, Get environmental up. racism. Look it not up. come on, environmental racism. No, no, actually, no, not. But like, let's no, end it. But, not, but, do, not but do Google racism. it. But do Google it and educate yourselves because it's, it's important. And keep it going. I love breathing clean air. Same. <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to mention breathing. something. I knew we yes. weren't going to get through a show without mentioning Beyonce. So thanks to Marco. once you... again, it was not me. <laughs> but maybe next. I will bear that trust. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll, uh, thanks for joining this week's episode of The Culture Report. We'll be back to continue the conversation next Thursday right here on 9 News Plus and 9news.com.